Well, good morning, Church at the Red Door. Welcome, friends. What an honor it is to have you join us here this Sunday morning. You know, today is a great day. It's a glorious day just to worship our Lord. And I was, I was thinking about this, you know, the weather's turned a little bit, get some cool breezes at night. It's like a breath of fresh air now. And speaking of that, Jesus is the breath of fresh air for sure. And what a glorious way in which to worship him today through this time with you. It's an honor for all of us to be here with you this morning. Pastor Jeff today is going to end up today with part three of a three-part series on sharing the gospel. Now, if you haven't seen the other two, if you weren't with us the last couple of Sundays, go to archive and take a look. I'm sure it'll be impactful if you do that. And today, in part three, it's going to be a very revealing message because Jeff is going to talk about why we need Jesus and the kingdom and his kingdom in this chaotic world. And part of that reason is, friends, that there are people today that are separated from our living God, our Heavenly Father. And he's going to talk about that. We've also got some special guests I'm going to be introducing today. I'm going to introduce the Emmett family, all right? Tom, Danielle, and Samantha. And they're going to read a scripture for Pastor Jeff today. I'm going to conclude now this introduction, and uh, we're going to move on into worship. But first, I'm going to open the service in prayer, and then, friends, we'll move into worship time. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, what an honor and a privilege, what an excitement it is to come and have this time to worship you, to be with friends and family and guests and new and old friends, Lord. We thank you so much for that, Lord. We thank you for everybody that's joining us here this morning. Would you touch their hearts, open their ears, Lord, to hear your word, and put your hand upon Pastor Jeff and this message today, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would it go forth. And Father, we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus of Nazareth. All right. Let us move on in and spend some time in worship together. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, Randy. Hello, Church at the Red Door. Uh, hope you had a wonderful week. I hope that you've been thinking a lot about, well, this series. I, I, I know that there's a passion. Look, I meet so many people that feel um, incapable or afraid or just don't feel that they have enough knowledge, whatever it is, to really effectively share the gospel in a meaningful way. I meet, meet them all the time, or they feel unworthy, or they feel whatever. I hope that this is driving into us. Look, this is an extraordinary story, and in learning to tell the story, I think it brings us back to a place of our own clean spot. Look, we are made clean by the blood of Jesus. If we will confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The retelling of the story, we can, look, I never tire of telling the story, of telling the gospel, if you will. I never tire of it. Why? Because it also reinforces what I know to be true. There's a kingdom that's invaded. There's an incredible future for us. Jesus came. He's going to come back. I mean, he was the fulfillment of everything the prophets had seen. This is a story that's been told for millennia. I mean, it's an amazing story. I never tire of telling it. And I think as I go through life, I become more effective at telling the story of the gospel, which also reinforces my own love of Jesus. Look, when I, even in preaching this, I fall more in love with Jesus. Even in preaching this, I see the mercy and the grace of the creator of the universe. As John said, full of grace and truth. Okay, so Last week, we talked about Jesus, again, just as a reminder, we talked about these two world, worlds now colliding, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, same thing, have invaded earth and its sin and its rebellion and its pain and its suffering, and first it was through a temple, and then last week we saw that Jesus is the new replacement temple, and now we're even talking about us becoming the temple is the church, those who love Jesus, and spreading these clean spots where people's sin can be absorbed by the blood of Jesus, to use the language, it's just language, 
and we create this clean spots. And as these clean spots increase, the kingdom of heaven comes to earth, just like we were instructed to pray by Jesus. Again, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy God space, thy everywhere, everything's done in accordance with God's will and ways, which is what makes it so fruitful and flower filled and glorious. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is already done in heaven. It's not two worlds, not two different planetary, physical, material bodies bouncing off one another. And then finally, this one kind of, no, it's an unseen dimension. It's a realm that is now invading. And at someday in the future, these two things will completely merge. We'll have then a new heavens and new earth. Well, maybe two not too different than some of these fires. You look at what happens. These things are just destroyed, these fires. But guess what happens? Then why? So new things can grow up. Old vegetation, old things that maybe have caused problems were burned away, and then now new growth comes. And so maybe that's what this new heavens and new earth, but it's not gonna be us going somewhere else. It's us on a new heaven in a new with new heavens and a new earth, and this is again consummated. By the way, that temple last week that we looked at, a lot of the images in the temple that Solomon dedicated, and then the one that even uh, Herod came and, and restored some, and at least as it relates to the outer courts. They had, they had pictures of Eden. They had pictures of this. It's kind of like that was the clean spot. But again, as we saw, we don't need a temple anymore. We don't have a temple anymore in terms of a material one. But we have Jesus and now we have the church, which are living stones being built into a dwelling place, a temple for God in the Spirit. Well, this week we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to give you a few talking points at the end. But this week... Well, what happens if all of this occurs and someone lives and they reject the temple, then they reject Jesus, and then they reject it grows, but they stay here? What happens to those people? Are they sent somewhere? Uh, what, what actually goes on? So we're going to talk about a place called hell. Now, we've, we've touched on this before, but this will have no hell in it. So all the hell that's in the world will be gone, will be eradicated. And people who never were part of a cleaning up process, a new heart, can't stay here. I mean, one of the things that God is very committed to, and again, back to Andy Blackmore, hell is God's decision to contain human evil. If God allows non-clean spots to enter, we just go back to where we were. This begins to exit again, and now we're back to where we started. Well, God has a very strong commitment not to let allow human evil to corrupt this space, which will be heaven and earth be made one again. And so necessarily those people aren't just eradicated. Now, some believe in annihilationism. I don't think it's biblically supported, but there is there are some scriptures that maybe some believe that that mean that I think we are an eternal soul. I think the Bible clearly teaches that. And that your consciousness, your, you will go on uh, for all of eternity, but you will be separated. So let's go to some of the conversation, biblically speaking. It's not just my opinion. We're going to try to put some of this together and get a picture of what this realm will look like. So let's go back. And I want to start with this verse. Okay, now catch this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 through 46. Now, this is Jesus' dialogue about people who had just rejected these little ones. Now, he might have been talking about the Jewish people in general. He might have, I think he's talking about everybody that would be followers of his, not just children. But he's in Matthew 25, he's talking about the, those that uh, don't care for uh, his brothers. And so, in some ways, it could be. Israel, and some people have said that, but I think just followers of Jesus in general. He says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. So there is a departure. Hell is a departure from the presence of God. It's one of the things we need to understand about hell. Jesus said, well, depart from me, accursed ones, into, now catch the language. This is tough. People, I don't believe in that. This is Jesus speaking. Into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so is this a torture chamber? Is this, what is this? 
It is a place that is outside the presence of God. It is a place, a containment place, if you will, never created for man. Look, it was never created for man. This, this realm of the dead, spiritually dead, was created for Satan and the demonic realm that rejected God. And we can go back into when that was. There's some debate about when that exactly happened. But there was a rebellion. There was a rebellion in heaven. And a third of the angelic realm, if you read Revelation 12 that way, fell. And that, that rebellion, they were cast outside the presence of God. And there was a place created for them. We get various pictures of this. So that's what Jesus is talking about. And then Jesus says, because I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. Now this could certainly mean literal food. Do we not have no compassion for those who have nothing to eat and drink? But it also, I think, spiritually speaking, says we need to be telling the gospel. This is true food and true drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. All those have spiritual ramifications. Unclothed, tattered rags, filthy rags, Isaiah said in Isaiah 64. Clothed now in the righteousness of Christ. So again, I think this means both. It is also caring for the poor, but it is also caring for the spiritually poor those who were enslaved, those who were in prison, the prison of Satan's forces. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he said, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, let me, let's just be clear, straight up. Jesus did talk about eternal fire and eternal punishment. Now, the first thing that comes to our mind is, is God in the place of hell setting up these, you know, masochistic torture chambers that medieval uh, painters often wrote about? Or is, and this is my contention, is eternal separation in and of itself eternal punishment? Of course it is. Is it eternal fire? We'll talk more about that, but the one thing that I, and you've maybe heard me teach on this before, some of you, but I will tell you that eternal fire, anytime anarchy breaks loose and authority is removed, and I'm just talking about some of the recent writing, it is ubiquitous through human history. Things get burned up, fires start. I don't, what is it in the human soul that any time there is a coming against of authority, people have the tendency to want to set things on fire. And we'll talk more in James a little bit later about this hell fire. Look, we start fires all the time. The iniquity of human beings, the end result leads to fire. It just always has, it always will. I don't think it's something that God has to go out and I don't, I don't see this, this is my view, as a literal lake of fire, how do you have human souls that, you know, fire destroys immediately, and that's why some people believe in annihilationism, where you just go away. I mean, you just, you go into this eternal sleep if you've rejected God. But I think there is an eternal torment, and it's always comes from the separation of God and his authority to rule and reign. Fire is always an inevitability. It seems in the fallen human nature, we set things on fire. We just do. And now we'll be in a place of complete anarchy where all wills are trying to grasp for authority and that will be a place called hell. But you know what's interesting is that Jesus also refers to this as outer darkness. I know there's some theological speculation about maybe this is a, a holding place, the abode of the dead, and then Eventually, there's the lake of fire, and there are two different places. But I, I think most theologians would agree that it's referenced as being outside the city, as the Valley of Hinnom. When we get to the New Testament, we often uh, we see, too, Tartarus, and we also see Gehenna, which is a derivation in Greek from where we get our uh, the Valley of Hinnom. Now, the Valley of Hinnom is a place, even pre-Israel, that the foreign nations 
uh, would come and they would sacrifice their own children to the god Moloch. And, and this was a place of utter devastation, as you can imagine. And it still existed. And so the old city, Jerusalem, was built. And just outside the gates was this valley of Hinnom, which we get Gehenna. And Jesus most often, and the word most often translated, hell in the New Testament is Gehenna or Hinnom. It was a picture. It was a word picture that everybody during the time of Jesus would have understood. So as he talked about Gehenna, he was talking about the place of trash being heaped, that dead corpses were out there, a place where, you know, uh, sorry to use graphic language, but maggots were feeding on the corpses and all these kinds of languages. And that's why we get some of this language. It is outside the city or outside the presence of God. That's what hell is. Matthew 25, verse 30, Jesus in his conversation about the unrighteous steward finishes this way throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We got no particular picture here of a lake of fire. You would think a lake of fire because of the fire would be bright and burning, and now we have outer darkness. Again, I think most of this language is not as literal as some would try to interpret it. That's my own view. Now, I will qualify it as that. Uh, but when we talk about light, fire and darkness and all this, how is that? I think they're different metaphors. Uh, outside the city, a garbage dump, the Valley of Hinnom, uh, all these places, Jesus is trying to communicate one thing. This is going to be a place of utter desperation, of utter hopelessness, of utter human rule. No God. You retract everything that is good. If God truly is love and you retract it all from this place, this place of eternal separation, it's going to be clearly weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's a horrifying, a horrifying prospect to imagine that you rejected this clean spot of Jesus' blood and this message of the gospel of the kingdom that was growing and you chose to go your own way. Jeff, why are you talking about hell? Because there's no way you have to, first of all, you have to have this as an understanding of the narrative. It rarely comes, if I'm sharing the gospel, that someone says, well, wait a minute, what about hell? Are you really believing that? You have to be able to articulate it. Why? Because Jesus, the gospel, meaning the story, the totality of what he did and taught, this is what Jesus taught. So when we're telling the gospel, we have to tell the entirety of the narrative. And the narrative includes, in the end, this glorious togetherness of new heavens and new earth and also eternal separation. Revelation talks about, again, a lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 13 and 14. Talking about, and in the end, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Again, is this literal? Is this to be interpreted literally? You can make your, you can, you can take a, a literal approach, or you can take a non-literal approach more of a symbolic approach. I tend to take a more of a symbolic approach. This we can agree on. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness and eternal separation. I don't want any part of it. I want what Jesus offered the world and then proved through what he did and taught. I want that. I want what he came to give me. It's an incredible news. Revelation 21 verse 8. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving, those who rejected the clean area of the temple of Jesus and his blood and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, brimstone is added to this either metaphor or this lake of fire. So I think one thing we can all agree on is I don't want any part of it. Now, one thing that we do know, too, and to go back to this illustration of the Valley of Hinnom. So imagine Jesus teaching and saying outside in Gehenna, or this Hinnom, this Valley of Hinnom on the southwest portion of the old city, 
What would that look like? Would they understand? Well, of course it would. Listen to this language in Mark chapter 9, verse 42 through 48. Now he's saying, look, don't cause these new believers to stumble. Let me just tell you, this is a huge thing. And he's trying to grab the attention of many of these religious leaders. Whoever causes one of these little ones, not just religious leaders, but anybody who would scoff and the scoffing and the mocking that goes on during the time of Jesus' ministry, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be, it'd be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than have your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire. Now again, literal fire? I don't know. I just think the fire of anarchy of the human soul is enough. Literal fires may break out, but I, I, I think this is just a picture of an inglorious place where human rule fights to take precedent over one another, and it's a horrible place where God's removed himself. And then it's added, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now what is he referring to? Well, they would understand immediately that outside the city, the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. It was a garbage dump. It's where they threw it outside the wall. Again, as I alluded to earlier, corpses and garbage and, and, and you know, these worms are just, let's be honest, they're maggots and they're eating and the scavengers. and this. It's a horrific place. Jesus chose that picture to describe eternal separation. He goes on to say, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Again, Look at that outside the presence of God, outside in the, the Valley of Anom, outside in the garbage dump. You don't want to go there. I'm just telling you. And he uses hyperbolic language clearly and says, whatever it takes, engage. Cut it off. Your eye. I mean, what he's doing is he's trying to say there is nothing in all your life that will be more important than the decision you make about Jesus, period. Jesus is grabbing our attention. He's not using just scare tactics, folks. He's using the reality of eternal separation outside the city of God, which will be a reunited new heavens and new earth. Second Peter, even in the New Testament, listen to the, listen to the uh, disciple Peter here, the apostle, speaking about false prophets one day, he calls it a place of black darkness, a little different than the, than the eternal lake of fire. Again, I think all metaphor, because there's some conflict. Again, these are springs without water, speaking of false prophets, and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. And then lastly, in the New Testament, Paul speaking to the church at Thessalonica. Again, we've alluded to this, but now I just want to show you the text on it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 Speaking of those who don't know God and don't, now catch this, here's the language he uses, and don't obey the gospel. Well, you think, I'm telling a story. Well, how, what do you mean obey a story? If the, the gospel is the whole life and teaching of Jesus and you don't obey, oh, if you don't listen to Jesus and his words about being the only safe harbor, the cross, if you don't realize that that is... You're not obeying the telling of the story. You're rejecting it. Again, as C.S. Lewis has often quoted, hell is a God's monument. <laughs> it's just so true. God's monument to human dignity and human choice. Eternal separation, God, this is the monument, right? To human's choice. You have a choice to... Enter the clean realm of Jesus and his life and the new robes, the festal robes, or you can go it alone. That's the choice we have. And as eternal separation, which is hell, is God's monument to that choice. You were created. You were intended to be an image bearer of God. 
you choose not to reflect God's image by the God living on the inside of you and you go your own way, create your own religion, create your own morality, create whatever it is that you want and you're gonna be a self-governing ruler. If that's the way you go, listen to Paul's language. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Guys, this is the glory of his power. You cannot imagine, we cannot fathom. The Bible says we can't even fathom the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I think we think of it in such small terms. Oh, if only I could break par on the golf course. Oh, if only I could just forever go and have a wonderful dinner, you know, with my, with my spouse. Oh, if I could just, I envision this place. And we just think of kind of things on earth that are good and that are blessings. And we just think, if I just have more of it. It's going to be so far beyond what you can think or imagine. The glory of his power with no draw of sin pulling us away. Uh, no pain, no suffering, no selfishness, nothing. Everybody on the same page or away from his presence. That is eternal destruction. That is eternal destruction. Hopelessness always destroys. So here's the question. Now we'll go back to the earth. Hell's already here. Hell rules and reigns right now on the earth. Do you not feel that? I mean, I feel, I've felt more of that this last few years of just, I have felt more the power of hell. The, the, yeah, there's been triumphs and joy along the road, but just the power of hell, I think we're all feeling it, to be honest with you. We hate seeing chaos. I, we hate racism. We hate... We, we hate the divisiveness of our, of our own country here in the United States, the, divis the divisiveness of nation to nation. I mean, all the immorality and the lies that are being told and the, the tribalism and theft and slander and anarchy rules. This place rules. Hell is already here. Andy Blackmore says, when this invaded... This temple, this new temple, this replacement temple, Jesus, he didn't call it replacement temple, John Dixon, but this replacement temple is casting the hell out of not only the earth, but us. This is hell. This is the work of Satan. We already get a picture of it. And what is it likened to? Well, let's go to James chapter 3, James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to have I had no wonderful, glorious, flowery messages, uh, scriptures for us to read, but we're going to have the Emmets read this week, uh, our precious family, uh, Tom and Danielle and Sam Emmett. I think Sam may even read it. And they're going to come to you now, and they're going to read James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Go ahead, Emmett family. We love you and miss seeing you. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, and good morning to our entire CRD family. We're the Emmets here in Palm Desert. I'm Tom. This is Danielle, celebrating her second anniversary this week as your church administrator. This is Samantha. She's on your AV team. We anxiously await the chance to get back to all our normal in-person activities with our CRD family. May God grant us all the joy of being together soon. Good morning, everyone. Today, I will be reading from James chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Have a blessed day and a beautiful week ahead, everyone. Back to you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you, Emmett. I appreciate that. I, that wasn't the most glorious thing to read. Uh, it's a stark reality, but here it is. Are you ready? The tongue itself is likened to fire. Okay, so if we do, if you do lean a little bit like I do in terms of what this eternal fire looks like, the tongue sets everything on fire. Literally sets on fire. Is that what James is, James is talking about? No. But the tongue is a relentless evil if it's, if it's connected to a heart that's not a new heart. It just sets everything on fire and is set on fire by hell itself. We get a clear picture of that. 
And again, as it says, uh, it defiles the entire body and sets the fire, sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. So it's not a literal fire from hell coming out of our mouth. I mean, we're not fire-breathing dragons, but it is the fire of hell. So if the fire of hell is this uh, horrific slander and divisiveness and mocking and all the things, and lies and deception and arrogance and all the things that can come out of our mouth, it doesn't even have to be. That's what hell will look like. That's what we feel in earth, but it's, it's also already having been invaded by heaven. So we're not getting the full, trust me folks, you are not getting the full effect of hell yet. You're not even close. That place of eternal destruction that Paul told the church at Thessalonica as a function of eternal separation. So uh, here's one of the things I want you to think about. When you think about, and I think about, the pain and the suffering of what will happen. Imagine this. I, I wrote this this week. I want you to listen. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the language used to describe hell. Ultimately, hell is simply the eternal separation, as we've been saying, from God's kingdom. God's intended image bearers. Intended meaning you were created. I don't. If you're out there listening and you've rejected Jesus your whole life, you think his kingdom, maybe you've never heard it till now and you've got faith. Wonderful. Welcome to the kingdom. Just enter in by faith. But you were intended to bear the image of your creator. Imagine who, but if you reject the news of the kingdom as seen through the life of Jesus, just imagine a person who rejects the Bible and never understands who am I or why am I here, and now they will the full ramifications of the truth of who they were, who the Bible says they were, and why they were on the this planet Earth, this fallen planet, will hit them with a force that can only be, I think, suggested to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The greatest remorse resulting in a violent, visceral, physical reaction. And they will know, tragically, that they will live forever with the answer to those two questions in hand, and they never embraced it by faith. They never listened. Even though Jesus proved himself over and over, and ultimately by his resurrection, they rejected his teaching. They rejected the gospel of his life and the message of the kingdom. They never entered it, and they will live forever with a knowledge of who they were. They were intended to be image bearers, and they only reflected their own self-rule. Folks, that, yeah, that is a part of the narrative, because it was the part of Jesus' narrative, as he described in the fullness of his life, that the kingdom of God was at hand. Enter it. Enter it by faith. So in conclusion, ultimately, I think there are a few things that I want you to think about in terms of possible talking points, and then it could lead you down an open road. You don't have to, you're, it rare will be the case that you'll get a chance to, you know, we spent virtually, you know, 45 minutes a week for three weeks describing and only kind of touching on it in some ways. We didn't even talk about the fullness of what the kingdom looks like or how it operates. I mean, there's a lot of things that we have not discussed, but we've given you some good bones. Rare will be the case that you're able to sit down and have the attention of someone to go through it all. Occasionally it will happen, but rare will be the case. So you'll have to plug these talking points in as you are able. But here's a few. Jesus wants the world that you want. You, I can, you can tell people that all day long. People want this. They just imagine that they're going to get it through um, some utopian society as we've looked at, or uh, just they, they think through education, through the right political party, through something, they think that they're going to be able, to, hopefully, and many people have given up hope, by the way, but they at least want this world. Jesus wanted this world, but he wanted it even more than you, even willing to give his own life to create the clean spot. 
Jesus wants the world. I, I tell people, look, tell me what you envision. What would be the utopian world that you would live in? And they'll give you a long list. And they may, you may not agree with all the specifics, but you will be able to say, well, Jesus wanted a world without strife and contention and anarchy and division as well. But the way you're going about it is self-rule. The way he goes about it is through sacrifice of his own life. Jesus pointed to the problem, and ultimately the problem was us, me, you. The problem is mankind. We've, we've talked about many times, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man and didn't entrust himself to men. He knew what was in man. He knew we could do nothing to save ourselves. Knew it. So if you complain about how would a good God allow it, well, it's us. It's our choice. That's how God allowed it, yes, but it was our choice. Jesus, through his atoning death, started the process of making things clean again for all those who would believe. Jesus told his disciples, you're already clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. Jesus began to create the clean spot. He is the new temple. Jesus proved that he was king and God through his life and through his teaching, as we've discussed. The kingdom is available to you right now. I mean... I think oftentimes we tend to kind of, well, if you'd come to church or, you know, well, go help us feed the poor people. People say, oh, I'll go help feed a few poor people in case there's a God out there or something. We're afraid to tell people that you're going to go on a journey with Jesus, right? And you enter through repentance and baptism and then, boy, you get in the car and let's go. We don't know exactly where we're going, but we're going somewhere. I'm going to talk about that in weeks to come. I shared a little bit of that uh, a message. Uh, our life, Abraham's life is our story. Shared that a little bit when I was in Salem. Seemed to be reasonably impactful. The kingdom is available right now, but the kingdom in its fullness will be available to you when you die as well. We get four tastes of it now, folks. We get little tastes. You're gonna have joy. You're gonna have patience and fruit of the spirit that will manifest in your life. But ultimately, you're gonna have hope you're gonna have a hope that will be sustaining. Look, Jesus came to invade this world, to destroy the works of this pathetic little place that is in rebellion to the rule of God. He confronted it and he confronted it by laying down his life. So what is our task ultimately? Tell the story, tell the story. Tell it in a compelling way. Don't just give half-truths. Tell it in a compelling way. Tell people that they can do it today. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you can do that today. Get in the car. The car is like Noah's Ark. It's a boat that will save you from any kind of judgment coming down the road. It's the cross. Get in the car. We're headed to Colorado, analogously. But no, we're headed... We're headed to spending eternity with Jesus. Get in the car, go through your baptism and start an adventure with Jesus. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful for you. I, I uh, Again, this won't be the last time we talk about how we share the gospel. But I, again, as, you, as I said the first week, our task is to introduce you to the kingdom for those of you who don't, have never entered the kingdom, to describe and tell the story of Jesus, to equip you to go on this road and to see you sustained on your road through worship and fellowship and all the different kinds of things. I know it's hard being apart. I can't wait for our reunite if we can get this thing, you know, fully fully off the ground. I can't wait to actually see you, maybe with your mask here, but see you outside face to face in November. But let me just say this, we love you. I hope this has been helpful for you. And it's been instructive and it has equipped you maybe to have a deeper conversation about the gospel than you ever have. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for our friends. I thank you for the gospel, the incredible news that heaven has invaded earth through Jesus' sacrifice, burial, resurrection, and all he did and all he taught. So Lord, thank you for this time together. I pray for uh, our extended family around the country. We love them so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a glorious week. Excited about the next couple of weeks. Paul's gonna bring uh, a beautiful uh, message to you. And then I'm gonna be pretty much back in the saddle starting 
in November through the majority of what we consider our season. Thank you so much. Love you. Have a great week.